Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Friday, March 1st, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to talk about entering the world of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. I have on with me today io9 and Gizmodo entertainment reporter Jermaine Lucier. What's up, Pete? Okay, so you were lucky enough last week with a group of uh, other journalists, a small group of journalists, to visit... Uh, Walt Disney Imagineering to visit Lucasfilm and actually step foot into the construction zone that is Star Wars Galaxy's Edge here in uh, the Disneyland Resort. Uh, what was it like? Uh, man, it, it, that's a, like, such a big question. I mean, like, even just like knowing it was going to happen wasn't real. <laughs> and even sit, sitting inside Lucasfilm, which I've been to a couple times, even been there with you a couple times. Yeah. It was like. On your bachelor party, even on my bachelor party, yes, that's that's how I do it. But it was, um, <laughs> it was just like uh, that was cool, and we were talking about this this place, and then we're, and then we're getting learn, learning all this new information, and then it was like, okay, now we're in Imagineering, and we're lo- learning all this information, and we're in this place that is kind of this mythic place for Disney people, and we're just absorbing all this information, and I was like, this is crazy, like we get to go tomorrow, and. We ha- I had to buy construction boots. Like they literally an email like you need to have specific kind of boots. You cannot wear just sneakers. You know, hiking boots are kind of okay. And I've been to Sundance in a few years, so I didn't have any boots. So I had to buy boots on Amazon, like, like overnight them. And then, uh, and and so the, even before we went in, we were just like doing these panels and learning about. You know, we're tasting the food and we're drinking the drinks. And I was like, this is all awesome, but like I still I can't. I can't get my head around it, you know? And then, and then like, you know, they, they bring us backstage and we're in these big warehouses that are basically like construction hubs, you know, where like they have the plans and where people go to the bathroom and stuff. And you're still not there. And then you just keep kind of walking and you just kind of walk. And then you start, start to get muddy. And, and I think it was Anthony Bresingham's like, it's like Mimbon from Star- Solo. And it was, it was just like muddy crap everywhere. And then you just like enter and, and you still not you still doesn't process because it, you're just like standing there and there's a sets up you know and it's it's you're in a theme park and it's still like very whatever and they but they told us they said we've designed this thing to have grand reveals from every entrance you come in and we weren't coming in one of the main entrances they couldn't yeah. open those up because people would flow in and start taking photos we had to come in through the back so it wasn't until we were standing in like this square and they're telling us about you know oh this is where the cantina is going to be blah 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 and you're still like this is cool whatever and then and then you turn the corner and you see the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. Ugh. And then and then you just you walk a little bit further and it just opens and it's there. And and while not everything is done, that is done. And we just like you just walk up to it and you know you you some it's it's you imagined it in the movies and you see people in the movies like standing underneath it. And but to actually stand underneath it like and look at it it's just, it's unbelievable. You know, it's like, I, it here it is. Like, this is everything. There it is. Like, and it's perfect. Like, there's got battle damage on it. And every little nook and cranny looks, like, amazing. And I'm the guy who built the 8,000-piece Lego, and that thing looks detailed. But <laughs> when you see it, you're just that, like... That thing's un- massive, and this thing's a lot bigger than this that. Thing, this, the, yeah, I mean, it's 110 feet long. It's probably, like, 25 feet high. I mean, it's the real thing. It is what it would be. And, and it, it actually we, should be said that, like, you know, we have not been to the set of a Star Wars movie. Like, right. you know, J.J. Abrams kind of when he came onto the this this new sequel trilogy kind of locked up the doors to the mystery box. And none of us have been lucky enough to set on, you know, you hear those stories from like Kevin Smith of stepping onto the the, uh, the Money and Falcon. And we, we have never uh, experienced this. So this is the first time you were in the star wars galaxy yeah really i mean like and, and i've done like star wars events here and there but this still was it was still something special and and even like when kevin smith stepped on the millennium falcon or whoever like it, they didn't build the whole falcon you know like yeah or, and if they did they built it at different scales or maybe not as detailed because they're trying to save money you know uh but this is a no expenses spared Millennium Falcon. I mean, obviously the insides don't work. Uh, you can, yeah, you could probably walk up into it. They wouldn't let us, but um, it, it doesn't look like what it would look like. Um, but it's still unbelievable. And, and at one point, we were walking around it. Excuse me, when we were learning about the ride, Smuggler's Run, and 
and the barrier isn't up for the line yet. So you can just walk right up to it. So I walked, I said, where's the barrier going to be? And the, the guy was like, it's going to be like right here. And I looked and I went to the barrier and I took like two more steps and I was like, can I touch it? And he looked at me and he goes, no. He goes, no. And turned around Jermaine, and walked away. Jermaine, Jermaine, Jermaine. You should have. It's always better to it. ask for forgiveness than permission. No, I know. I know. I should have done it. Like, it was just, it just would have been so easy. It was right there. And, uh, yeah, so I was not able to touch it on the back. It would have been right on, like, the butt. Like, boop, boop. Um, it, we, yeah, we, and, we still don't know when this is going to open, right? Like, this is summer 2019? Or do we even know yeah. that? Have they just said su- – yeah, they said summer 2019. Yeah, they, they said summer. And then, like, you, you know, you and I have done some, you know, offline investigation. I think it's going to be, like, late June. Yeah. But they were – but, like, this was, like, you know, official capacity, this whole thing. So they just said summer. <laughs> they would just say all these things, you know? And, Okay, let's talk about Smuggler's Run since you mentioned that. Uh, yeah. You got to walk the queue and, and actually step inside the Millennium Falcon. Uh, tell us about Smuggler's Run. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the, the, the whole thing with this is like they want you to live your Star Wars fantasy, right? And what is like top three of that is I want to fly the Millennium Falcon. So that was how they developed this ride. And w- what's cool about it is, uh, yeah, they have the whole story around it that Hondo Onaka, this pirate from the cartoons, uh, has, has, you know, bartered with Chewie to use the Falcon for a couple smuggling runs uh, in order for him to make money and Chewie to give stuff to the resistance. And so you walk through the queue and there's like, you know, there's a big Hondo, uh, 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 animatronic, animatronic. Hondo that's, yeah. yeah, animatronic Hondo uh, who explains that to you. And there's some like, you know, monitors here and there. And, but you're walking through his like sort of shop. So there's all these kind of like huge engine parts that are being worked on and things. It's, it's very, very cool. Uh, it's a shorter queue than I expected the actual interior of it, which of course, will be an issue. Uh, but once you get to the front, what's interesting is it's different from um, every Disney ride, I guess, where they give you boarding passes, right? Like you're in a group of six, and they give your six, they give your group of boarding passes, and then you just hang out in this big area, and the area just happens to be the chess room, you know? And this was done, so I got to see it in full thing. They made us put booties on so that we wouldn't scuff it up with our construction boots. And it's, I mean, again, perfect. Oh, it, it's going to get scuffed up. Oh, it will get scuffed up, but not... <laughs> It'll get stuffed up day one, but they didn't want us to do it, you know, four months out or yeah. five months out. So, and it's beautiful. I mean, but that again, I sort of stayed on that because of like the solo junket. You know, they had something like that. Yeah. Um, that you could like take photos in, but it's still the lighting and stuff is better here and super awesome. And so, yeah, you'll just sort of hang out in there and then somebody will call your boarding number and you walk down a hallway and make a left and go into the cockpit, just like you'd see in a movie. See, I was, I was, I was very curious about this because I was originally anticipating the line was. You know, they would let you into the Money and Falcon, and then you'd have to go straight to the cockpit, and, like, people would be trying to take photos around the Falcon, and, like, you know, that would yeah. hold up the, the the you know, boarding of this ride, because to board the ride, you have to kind of go through that set to enter the cockpit, which is on this, like, rotating turntable of cockpits, but that's... Right, which, which, they, which they didn't want, it. they would not tell us anything, they're like... Yeah. They, like one, the one guy wouldn't even confirm that it wasn't, that it was more than one cockpit, and then finally, <laughs> at the end of the day, the guy, another guy... His boss was like, yeah, it's more than one cockpit, but we're not telling you how you do it. You know, yeah. like that's part of Disney magic. But, yeah, no, it's so because I think that's something they did on like Guardians of the Galaxy that they really screwed up is that they made this awesome like, you know, lobby with this like awesome like five minute movie. And then they just you skip it to go right through. And like you, nobody gets to see that movie. Nobody gets to look at all the cool props. But I think they kind of realized that, oh, that was a mistake and like have really let you kind of, uh, you know, take it all in with this ride. And, and that's the whole point. Like. The queue is is kind of like a, a half circle that goes back and forth above, like uh, up levels because they want you to always have a view of the Falcon. So as you're like you know, so you see it like you know from the bottom, then you go you turn and go back the way you came, but a little higher in the queue, and so you get better views of it. And the the one Imagineer that was giving us the tour said like he's like oh right here, this is like our highest point. It's my favorite view of the Falcon in the park. Like you know, and that's from inside the ride. Hmm. And it's gonna be so good at night. I couldn't even imagine it at night. Oh my god! Like that, that they we, we were there at like noon. You know, it was bright, bright, bright sun. But uh, yeah, and and so and then yeah, then you go into the cockpit with your six people, and uh, there's two pilots, two gunners, and two engineers, and they 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 swore up and down that each ride is just as fun. But I'm like, really? How, how is it gonna work? Because I feel like the people driving or you know flying the Falcon, that's like the fun. Right, but I think you, but shooting is fun and like doing like deflector shields and stuff. That's yeah, yeah. kind of cool too. It's, it's important. It's important, you know. 
and it's all about working together. And I straight up asked, like, I have the audio I could play sometime. And I was like, like, what if you're on there with like a bunch of idiots and they is, can you have a bad ride on this ride? You know, if, if the people don't care and they're like, they're like, no, that's it's set in place that you can have a bet. Like the ride cannot go well for you, but it's still fun and entertaining. You know, you might be able, you might smash the Falcon up a bunch, but you're never gonna die. You know, yeah, it's gonna, gonna it's like, on some kind of rails of some kind. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, metaphorical rails because yeah. you're just in this thing and it's all like on screens. But yeah, yeah yes, yeah, yeah, you're uh, just yeah. There's bumpers in it basically. And uh, how was being in the Falcon? I know you've been in the Falcon in that uh, solo experience that they yeah, also had at Comic Con, and many people have done. Yeah, which was which was pretty awesome, and uh, it, this this is different because the like it just feels more real. I mean, yeah. because it's well, it's, you can touch you know, every button, right? You can touch every button. And they all go in and click up and down, and like, and I was actually, you know, they they had us come in like six at a time, real quick, sit down, feel it, and then get out. We're about a group of like twenty, uh, and and like I so I was sitting, I think, in the gunner seat, and then like, but as they were coming out, I waited, and I just went up and I touched the uh, the handle to bring the. Uh, you know the uh, the light speed down, and I thought and it just it's got a real nice weight. Like it feels like when you take it, you really you don't have to like really pull it down, but you have to pull it down a little bit, like just right. It was really good. Okay, let's talk about Rise of the Resistance, the other ride that's in this uh, park. Before we get to like all the like the really new stuff you you learned, um, this is the trackless ride system. This is um, we've seen lots of like concept art photos of this. What what what, do, what can you tell us about this ride? Right. Well, nothing that hasn't been on your site. I'm glad I didn't read it, because um, <laughs> yeah, because you guys posted like pretty much the whole ride, and but and, and I didn't know. I mean, what's cool about it is yeah, it's a trackless ride that you know it's kind of uh, it's akin to Ratatouille at Disney or kind of like Transformers or uh, uh, Spider Man, but uh, at Universal, but you know more advanced. So it's that idea, but that's only part of the ride. The other part is like yeah, is you get. You know, they recruit you on this mission. You know, once you get through the insanely long line, they have plenty of space at this one. <laughs> um, and I've heard uh, rumors that they have like ten hours of possible line over there. <laughs> oh, it's it's huge. Like it was like we cut it off, and you could just see it was just like it reminded me of uh, you know like Hogwarts has like a lot of line they don't use, yeah. and this was like insane. And um, but yeah, they recruit you on this mission, and then you walk outside to this like other area. And and impose X wing there, and they're like, and this is one of the first reveals that you're in the section. But I look to my right, and I just see this construction workers working, and they're like, this is this hidden thing. And I'm like, are you sure? Like, I can see the whole park from here. And they're like, they're like, no, no, no. They're like, we're gonna have trees go up, and this whole section that you're in right now will only be visible from inside the ride. So pose X wing, uh-huh. the entrance to the second uh, transport that you're getting on, a couple other things. <laughs> Excuse me, um, is only visible from the ride. So then you get on. Poe, I guess, screams at you, like, hey, help us out, blah, 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 et cetera. And you get on this other thing. And Nyan Nub is, uh, is flying. And These are yeah, all on screens, get, I assume? Uh, I think, yeah, I think Nyan uh, Nub is, uh, it might be an animatronic, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, Poe is uh, almost certainly on a screen. Um, but, yeah, then, then you're like, you know, you you know, you know, you fly into space or whatever based on these screens, the, uh, the windows and the, and the thing. Then you get sucked into a tractor beam. And that's when the other doors open. And you've been trans like the same door, I think, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's actually Either the way. same door is what so I've you heard. Think, yeah, so you think you're going to walk out the one way, but you actually walk out into a Star Destroyer. And that, to me, like, I didn't know that was coming. And even people who hear this, like, oh, I wish I didn't know it was coming. It, it, you still can't do it justice. I mean, and it was not done. Like, where the Falcon was done, this was not done. But, like, I described it. It's kind of like a high school gymnasium size. It's really big with a 100-foot screen. Huge ass Tie Fighter on the side, you know. It looks like the the hangar from Force Awakens and uh, in Last Jedi, and you know they're kind of on those like slants, the Tie yeah. Fighters, and uh, and it's it's it was overwhelming because like even like the Falcon, like you see in the Falcon, and 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 you know like I, I was sort of walked on the Falcon before, little things here or there, even if it's a model type thing, but I've never been on like a Star Destroyer, and like <laughs> and it's it's completely immersive, like it's closed in, you're inside now, the ride system kind of and i just lost i lost it that's when i kind of got like choked up and started i had a couple of tears i'm like oh my god this is great and this was just like wires on the thing like when it opens there's gonna be 50 stormtroopers there uh most of them most of them stationary a couple animatronic just to give it like a feel you know 
And then they're going, then like people from the first order grab you and I grab you, direct you down these hallways, which also weren't done. And then they put you in the detention block. And that's when like Kylo Ren says something to you. And that I think at some point is when you get on the track list thing and they wouldn't show us. I straight up was again, was like, can we see the full size ad ads? And they're <laughs> like, no. And I'm like, but I know they're there. Like, and I they have them built because they've shown photos. Right. They, they were the first thing that was built, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, they would not show them to us for real. I think just because they didn't want us to see inside the ride for some reason. Um, but yeah, it, it, again, it, that's going to be amazing. As amazing as Smuggler's Run is, I think Rise of Resistance is going to be even better. And where Smuggler's Run, you, uh, you know, your ride will change depending on how everybody does. I said, like, does this ride ever change? And they're like, there are variations. So I don't know exactly how, but they did tell me that that is true. One one of the big bits of news here is we kind of it had been rumored that Kylo Ren is going to be in this ride, um, and I've actually heard that you're going to be able to fear, feel the heat from his crossblade lightsaber, which is kind of cool. Um, but the uh, the big news I think was that Ray Finn and Poe and BB-8 are part of this ride. Something that wasn't known beforehand. Um, yeah. You said Poe's going to help you. Like, wh- how is Ray and Finn going to be involved? Uh, well, BB-8 and Ray are what you're going to see in, like, the, the holding area or the go room or whatever. So Ray is on a screen, and she tells you, like, welcome to the Resistance. Like, we need your help. And BB-8 is in there with her. bb is actually there. Ray is on a screen. Uh, or a hollow projection, maybe, even. Um, kind of like, you know, like, uh, you know, help me, only uh, Kenobi, I'm the only hope. And then, yeah, Poe, I think, is on screens as well, and he tells you he's going to help you. Uh, and Finn, they told us, was actually in the, uh, the other part of the ride. So he must be part of the... Uh, the resistance that comes and helps you escape because because Poe like leaves. I think Poe's like, oh, you're stuck. I'm gonna go get help and leaves. And then like while you're escaping, I think on this trackless ride, I think they I think the resistance arrives and I think Finn is with them. Uh, and I think that's how it works. Disney better get a video of John Boyega going through this ride and seeing himself <laughs> as an animatronic because that'd be awesome. Well, but, I think he's on. I think he's video too. I think oh, I don't think he's an animatronic. Yeah, uh, I think these are all video. I don't think they made if they did made animatronics of it. They they did not yeah. show us. We only saw a couple of the animatronics. Yeah, um, but mentioning these characters in this and uh, Kylo Ren specifically makes me think that this has to take place some place before Episode Nine. Uh, yeah, they said they just said this trilogy is all that Pablo Hidalgo said when I specifically asked that question. Uh, he gave me, he rolled his eyes when he saw me ask the question. He's like, oh, he knows it's coming a canon question. Um, but there's, but, yeah. uh, but I read there's porgs aboard the Millennium Falcon, so it has to. No, it, it, yeah, it's definitely it's got to be after episode. I mean, like, just if those characters are there, it has to be between eight and nine, right? Because even if like the First Order Resistance were still fighting after nine, like these characters are, they filmed it now. They filmed it in the last whatever you know, couple of years, yeah. probably maybe towards production end of production eight, beginning production on nine. Uh, I'm not sure specifically. They said they went to London to film them, is yeah. what they said. But, those, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it I, can't I, take place after nine because no, I assume the First Order has to be destroyed, and I assume Kylo Ren is going to, as any villain in a franchise, going to meet his fate of some kind, and not yeah. be the, at least not be the bad guy at the end of the the episode. I don't know anything on that part. Right, but, right. No, yeah. I, I, I mean, like they wouldn't specifically say that, but yeah, I mean, I would bet anything that yeah, that like the episode nine, there's going to be. Ha- However many years between the two, and this battle is one of the battles that happened between those years. So tell us about some of the other stuff you can do. Like, uh, there's like an Ollivander's experience, like in Wizarding World of Harry Potter, you can get your own wand, and it's like this interactive, like special effects experience, or something like on the line of that here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called uh, it's called Savvy's Workshop, and uh, yeah, it's build your own lightsaber, which is super cool. But what's even cooler about it is that like you know like everything's in world, so you know, lightsabers in Star Wars aren't something that people just grab and, like, can make, you know? They might grab them, but they can't make them. <laughs> so, like, so, you know, you have to be, like, you know, something strong with the Force to get the kyber crystal, all these type of things. So the, there's a whole story behind it where this guy, Savi, he's, like, a junker who's been collecting lightsaber parts in, like, throughout the galaxy from, like, junkyards and stuff and, like, holding them all at this shop, hoping that one day a hero would come and put together a lightsaber and that hero is you. <laughs> and your 13 friends who made reservations, most likely, uh, to do this experience. And, yeah, you go in, and then you have to choose one of four uh, disciplines. I wrote these down. It's power and justice is one. Power and control is another. Elemental and nature is one. And protection and defense is the other. 
Uh, and depend, you say, like, well, I want protection and defense. And then they, based on that, they give you a kit. And so each, each one of those has a different kit of pieces. Um, and then you put the pieces together, and then you pick what kyber crystal you want, whatever color you want your blade. And then that all goes together. And it's all real nice, because like, you can do, like, a build the saber now at Disneyland and Disney World, but it's, like, real crappy plastic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like that. those Hasbro to- toy parts. It's, like, very yeah. plasticky. Yeah, no, this and this is, like, legit. Like, you're building, like, a, a real nice heavy saber hilt. And you do that, and then, like, they have the sort of force effects blades um, that are coded to the kyber crystal. So you could buy one blade and put it in different sabers. Like if you buy three or four sabers, you only need one blade and it'll light up blue on the blue one, red, purple, green, whatever, depending on. So like the, the blades are coded with the kyber crystals. Um, and, and then that's it, but there's a whole story and then a whole, you know, the, the, you know, a person will do it. They said it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, they wouldn't explain, uh, how much it costs or anything, (laughs) but they did say it might have to be a reservation thing because, if there's 15 people, 14 people at a time and it takes 15 minutes each, like you figure it out, it's yeah. only a couple hundred a day and it's just not enough. But that was super cool. Like that was something they revealed on this trip. That sounds amazing. And then there's something similar we kind of knew about with droids where you can build your own droid. And uh, though I was kind of going in under the impression they were full size droids. I, I do not. Th- that is not true. Um, they might sell full size droids, but the ones that you build are about uh, about 12 to 16 inches high. And um and again, you 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 choose if you want an uh, you know R unit or a BB unit, and then you kind of pick the colors and the different decals or whatever. And then those are radio controlled. Um, and if you drive them around at Galaxy's Edge, which you will never be able to be because the crowds will be too big, <laughs> but hypothetically, uh, it, they'll interact with different things. Um, you know, like you could go up to certain places. I'm sure they'll give you a map or something, and like they'll do different things, kind of like a wand. Like so, like yeah. you have a wand experience, but then the wand experience is the droids. Yeah, I, I just don't imagine that there's going to be any room to drive those around Galaxy's Edge, and I also don't imagine a kid is going to be wanting to hold this big kind of clunky droid and carrying it around. Like, I feel right. like it's going to be the adult carrying it in the bag. There was actually this funny photo that was going around uh, Twitter that showed, like, the the image of the father and daughter in front of the Millennium Falcon that I think you had on the header of your piece. Yeah. Like the yeah. Concept and it said, this is Disney's photo of it. Here's the reality. And the reality was like just a crowd, a massive crowd, like look, trying to look over each other, taking photos of the Millennium Falcon and, and nowhere to move, which I right. think well, that, I, I did see it. It was very funny. I mean, and like I said, we asked about that. I said like, how are you going to handle crowds? And or is there going to be a reservation system? All these things. And they're just like, operations are, is looking into that. And that was all they kept saying, <laughs> which was disappointing. But they did say one thing I mentioned in my new article was um, they built everything a little higher than you'd expect so that they so that you can still walk around and see stuff. It's not like all at eye level. Like like I mentioned, like this huge statue that's going to be outside of Doc Ondar's. He's like this hammerhead alien who sells all the rare antiquities. Excuse me. And there's going to be like this statue of a priestess up there. And what that is... For Star Wars, we won't know, or maybe we'll find out, but it's high enough that you can see it. And the Falcon, obviously, is like 25 feet up, so you might not be able to get a clean picture of you with it, um, but you'll be able to look at it, you know, because it's much higher than everyone else. And, you know, all the ride vehicles are up, like the new TIE Echelon, which they have out there, which I'm sure is in Episode Nine, um, um, which kind of looks like a, uh, I don't even know how to, how to do it, like a like a diamond with the head and the bottom cr- cut off. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, uh that's there, and again, it's high up, so you can look at it. Same thing with the X wing and the A wing. Well, the, actually, the A wing's on the ground, so that's wrong. But anyway, yeah. Um, so it, they 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 thought about these things, but you know, I, I still don't know if they know just how much anticipation is out there. Let's talk about the, st- uh, the the shops and what you can buy here, because everything's in universe. Everything is like. You know, you can't just buy like an action figure of Ray on the shelf that says like you know Star Wars or Disneyland on it. Like, there's none of that, right? No, no, no. It's cool too because, um, yeah. So there's a story behind everything. Like, there, like with the lightsaber. Like, if for there to be a Ray action figure, there has to be a reason how it did it. So, and the, it's a Toydarian toy maker, and she's like a Toydarian like Watto, and and she hears these legends of people around the universe, and then hand makes these dolls. And so basically, like the doll that Jin has in Rogue One, they sort of went by that. They didn't say that specifically, but they went by that kind of aesthetic. And backtracked it to like, you know, this is what, um, you know, so like Kylo Ren and Finn and all these heroes that have these mythologies around them, you can buy their dolls that are made like that. And like, um, 
Yeah, and the uh, so that's, what, that what, is, what about yeah. collectible uh, collectibles? Like uh, you and me, we want to go to Star Wars Land, and we want to like have like come some kind of big statue we can buy or something like yeah. that. Like what right, about for in, us? Yeah, that's in Doc Ondar's Den of Antiquities, which is basically like he's a uh, you know he's a dealer of rare antiquities, quote unquote rare. That Disney has a big warehouse of in the back is more like <laughs> it. But um, uh, yeah, and like so there, he has a collection of all this stuff. Like he has a stuffed Wampa, and he has. On the floor, we saw this on the on the shelf. All the blasters, like you, the iconic blasters, he's got those. You can't buy blasters because it's a gun in Disney, but they have them there because it's Star Wars. And like, and so there, you can buy like yeah, like busts of ancient Sith and like you know a bookshelf, you know books uh, and stuff, and uh, you know all these like kind of crystals. And that's where they sell the legacy lightsabers, like replicas of the lightsabers. So you could, and they only showed us like. Uh, you know, the, you know the Skywalker lightsaber, Kylo Ren, a couple of others. But then we got them to say they're going to have Qui Gon, they're going to have a Tano, and they're going to have a bunch of like other. So basically, like anybody who's ever had a lightsaber, you pretty much be able to buy it there. And those are about 110 bucks. Excuse me, they start at and that, they come in a really nice case. But if you want like a hilt, now excuse me, a blade, uh, that's an extra 50 bucks. If you want like a stand to like display it on, that's an extra like 30 bucks. Like they really get you with the little nickel and diming. Um, but those are super cool and really nice and not maybe, uh, they're probably almost master replica or uh, a quality, but obviously mass produced. Like, so they're, they're not limited. Like some of those, uh, things that you could buy, you know, from sideshow or whatever. But, um, yeah, so that, that store is super cool. And like a lot of the stuff isn't on sale. It's just kind of on display, but the Imagineer I asked about it, we we're talking about it. And he said, like, he goes, if like, if people all day, every day come in and ask about this one thing, and we don't make it, I'm sure the cast member will be like, we should make that, and we might make it. Like, it's not locked in. They just, he said they populated it with stuff from every era of Star Wars, and he said people from Lucasfilm came down, and they're like, what is that? Oh, my God, I forgot about that. Like, they're like, they just, we just stuffed that place with crap. So that's going to be really cool. I'm not sure if it was your write-up or someone else's, but someone said that the third ride in this in this land is actually this app that's yeah. part of it. Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, and I did say that was me. Um, it was I mean, somebody else might have taken it. It wasn't like a genius observation. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know. I thought it was a clever, <laughs> oh, clever wording. I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so the app is, I mean, they built, from the beginning of this, they knew they wanted to make it interactive. Uh, so, like, they wired it from the beginning to be uh, accessible with this app, which is the Play Disney Parks app, which is already available as sort of like a test run. But really, that app was made not just for, like, playing in line it was made for star wars land it was made for batu galaxy's edge and once it opens you'll be able to open that app and flip over to the star wars section and then you know there's uh you know it's got a uh, it's got four main things it's got the tools menu it's got the jobs menu it's got the map and the profile profile is where you know you'll you'll have your name and it'll keep all your credits or achievements or whatever that is they're kind of vague except to say that those things would carry over map is obvious uh, the jobs are where you would like accept jobs from the First Order or the Resistance or smugglers, and you'd walk around the park and do separate things. And how you would do those things is you'd use the tools, and the tools are like uh, scan and translate and uh, and hack. And there's one more that I'm blanking on, but you uh, so you so like you get a job, and Hondo will be like, you click on the job board and be like, I want to do this, and Hondo will be like, Oh, I need you to like find these packages for me. I think they're in these areas, so you'll go. And then you'll go and scan all these packages like that. They'll just have like a big thing there, a big, you know, props of uh, packages. And you'll go and scan them. And then once you scan them all, Hondo will like text you on your app and be like, oh, thanks so much. I'm glad you got it. Here's some whatever. And, and based on like who you do jobs for and how well you do them, they'll sort of assign you an allegiance. Um, and in addition to the jobs, which you can either do on your own or with like a family, you can sort of link them up like you do now with a fast pass. But is uh. There's also going to be like this ingress game where like people who are in the park with that sign in and want to play the game can walk around and sort of steal uh, land from the other side and it'll be resistance versus first order. And then that game will sort of end and then a new one will start. Th that game is always going on and it ends or starts based on how many people are playing it um, at any given time. So it, there's I mean, and, and that seems like a lot of detail, but it really isn't like we didn't get a hands on with it. And even like we didn't really get we got some questions during the panel, but we didn't really get much follow up. Uh, so that's something that I'm still uh, really curious about, especially with the crowds. Like, I, I mean, are people going to be running around doing this app? Uh, <laughs> is it going to be fun if there's that many people? Are you going to be able to like, get from side A to side B if you need to? I don't know. But also, yeah, how, I mean, like, how is the app going to work if there's so many people on the cellular and Wi-Fi networks at the same time? 
well, they said they said it's all an offline experience. It's all based on Bluetooth and location services. Very so smart. They, yeah, so they said you would need obviously on you would need Wi-Fi or something to download the app. So they're going to encourage people to do that before they get into the park. Uh, though they did say they're putting in more Wi-Fi hotspots uh, in the park, which is something they uh, I didn't put in my article because it's kind of obvious. But they did say yeah, they did say it's Bluetooth and location, so it's all offline. So yeah, you shouldn't have to worry about it. But they are very aware of connectivity issues. So you go on these missions. These missions can last like a few minutes to like hours. Days. Yeah, well, it's funny. Like at one point, somebody said, "Oh, some of the missions are like multi-day missions." So then I asked for uh, clarification on that, and they were like, "Oh no, just the profile carries over." So I don't know for sure. Like I tried to find mm. out more, and they kind of stonewalled me on it. But yeah, like they definitely can go from probably a couple hours uh, to seconds. They said there's some games that are like 10 seconds that you could be like, oh, try this. And you can hand it to your kid and like, you know, you tap something real fast and it's over, you know, like so they, they said like they because they, they know that a lot of people are really into Star Wars and a lot of people aren't. I don't know who those people are. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of people who are really, really adept at gaming and people who aren't. So they wanted to make it accessible to everybody. So if there's somebody who is really into gaming and uh, high level of difficulty. There are things for them. And if there's stuff that's, you know, real easy and they just want to get sort of an entry level thing, they have that, too. I guess my last question on this is, what do you get out of this? Do you get Republic credits? What do, what do the credits go for? Like, what what do we get from going on these, like, you know, missions for the entire day? I have no idea. I, that, it was one something we tried to find some more information on. And they were very unclear. The only thing I know is that, like, things that you get carry over. So, like, if you get credits or if you get a reputation or you get a thing, you come back to the park the next time. That stuff is still going to be there. Uh, but yeah, I don't know how you what what it equates to in the real world. Um, excuse me, it might not be anything. It might just be like yeah. you know, like oh look at me, I'm a level ten, whatever. You know, like if I play, you get a new avatar you know, or something. Yeah, new avatars and stuff. Yeah, they did say that was one of the games. Was like yeah, you could find like different skins for your avatar uh, if you uh, you know translate the right thing or scan the right thing. So yeah, it might just be like a Fortnite type thing or you know Final Fantasy where you level up in the app and that's kind of it. But I'm really not so. I'm really not 100 percent sure on that. Um, I know we're going over time here, so very quickly, what 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 did you learn about the food? Like, what was the best stuff that you tried? Yeah, oh man. I mean, it's all it's all kind of familiar, but with a little bit of a twist, you know. Be it the chicken or the ribs uh, or the shrimp. Um, I, the best thing I tried, my favorite thing uh, besides all the booze, uh, was the the thing called Oga's Obsession, and it's. At the cantina, they have non-alcoholic drinks and they have alcoholic drinks. First time at Disneyland. You can't leave the cantina with them, though. Um, and So that's going to be real fun because that cantina is not big. But uh, they also have snacks. They have this kind of like trail mix type thing that I forget what it's called. I don't think it has a name yet. Uh, but then they have Oga's Obsession and it comes in a Petri dish. And it's like a – it's almost like boba tea. So it's got like little balls in it. But it's like jello. It's like j- boba tea jello. Mm-hmm. And uh, – with with pop rocks and dried fruit on it and there's photos of it out and it looks kind of weird and disgusting but it's really good and i was like this feels like star wars to me like this little spoon and i'm eating it out of a petri dish and these little bubbles are popping and i'm like yeah this is it and it was good you know so like that was my favorite thing everything else is kind of like oh this is cool this is you know star wars chicken but it's chicken it's just a little different they wouldn't we couldn't try the blue milk unfortunately uh they, they didn't get their delivery in for us to taste but <laughs> Obviously, you can't, you know, unless you're Ron Burgundy, you don't want to drink milk in the sun. So they uh, they said it's basically like there's two places you can get it. You get the milk stand, which is like a, a place outside, like a, a normal stand, or inside the bar. And in the bar is more of a traditional milk type thing, just like chilled and normal. Um, uh, but in the outside, it's it's like a slushy almost is sort of how they described it, you know. Um, but, you know, with uh, – and it's plant-based dairy, so it's good for vegan pe- uh, vegans and everybody. Um, and they said it's delicious. And the one taste, the blue one tastes like berry, and they have a uh, green too, just like the Theraserans on Octo, and uh, yep. and that tastes more like tropical. Um, so we didn't get to try that, but it sounded pretty good. Well, very cool. Uh, you can read. You have like two articles on this experience on uh, Gizmodo, right? Uh, yeah, go to io9. It's probably easier. You can get it through Gizmodo as well. But io9.com or, or my Twitter, they're up there at Jermaine Lucier. And, uh, yeah, I get into detail on all these things and a bunch of other weird stuff. 
Yeah, and we also have a roundup on SlashFilm.com along with yeah. a bunch of the photos and stuff. Uh, thank you, Jermaine, for joining us. Uh, where can people find more of your work online? Uh, the same places to find the articles. <laughs> io9 and uh, on you know, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, at, at Jermaine Lucier. Cool. You can find me at SlashFilm on all social media. You can find the stories that we mentioned right here linked in the show notes so if you want to access them go to the show notes and you can find them there this podcast slash from daily is published every weekday on itunes google overcast spotify all the popular podcast apps please feel free to send us your feedback questions comments concerns to us at peter at slash dot com and head on over to our itunes page give us a five-star review tell your friends spread the word and we'll see you on monday <laughs>